Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the Cities Initiative webinar series focusing on municipal climate adaptation in the Great Lakes region. Uh, this is our final webinar in the series, so thank you to those of you who have joined us for one or more of these in the past few months. Uh, I'm Laura Bresheim in the Cities Initiative Chicago office. Unfortunately, uh, Nicola Crawhall cannot be with us this morning, so I will be presenting on her behalf. Uh, we'll start with our Cities Initiative presentation on uh, shorelines, ports, and harbors, and then we will turn it over to our guest presenter today, uh, Dr. Catherine Call. Dr. Call is a conservation and public policy specialist at the Nature Conservancy. She's also worked with NOAA on a variety of shoreline studies, so we thank her for being with us today. We'll have about 10 minutes at the end of the session for questions. Um, if you do have a question at that point, please click the raise hand button and we'll connect you via the phone. Uh, you may also write a question in the chat box and we will relay the message. So thank you for joining us everyone and uh, we will get started. As you can see today we'll be talking about ports and shoreline management. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of background and then move to the impact of climate change on ports, marinas, harbors, and shorelines in the Great Lakes region, as well as some challenges facing Great Lakes shoreline managers. So some background in the U.S. Uh, in the Great Lakes on the U.S. side, there are 130 coastal cities and towns with federal navigation projects that include such things as channels for navigation, structures like breakwaters and piers. Uh, these structures were often originally authorized to safeguard, na safeguard navigation and maritime commerce. However, they also provide critical flood and storm protection for public and private buildings, roads, facilities, and waterfront areas, some cases for things like power plants, water supply systems, as well as wastewater treatment facilities. Over half of these structures were built prior to World War I, so over 80% of them are older than their typical 80-year lifespan. Uh, most coastal infrastructures are somewhat vulnerable to changes in climate, uh, particularly increased and decreased precipitation. We'll get more into those uh, details in the rest of the presentation. Moving on to the uh, background and the, the commerce perspective, ports are very critical to trade and transportation networks in the United States. 78% uh, of U.S. foreign trade by weight is handled by ports and 44% of trade by value. These ports represent billions of dollars in capital improvements as well as new investments. Um, while the risk that climate change poses to ports is somewhat unclear, it is clear that ports will be impacted and shoreline managers should plan for continued resiliency and reliable operations in these unpredictable conditions. Um, there are some primary needs to achieve effective port adaptation measures such as um, uh, port and shoreline authorities do need some additional information about the specific impacts they may face. And uh, data and recommendations are not yet scaled down to be useful at the local and regional level. So that is some continuing work on these projects. Uh, just some quick facts. There are 610 miles of channels in the Great Lakes uh, 117 harbors that are federally serviced by the Army Corps of Engineers, 104 miles of breakwaters, which is a $3.3 billion investment in breakwaters alone. Um, there are 20 dredge disposal facilities. This is something we'll talk about a little bit further into the presentation, each valued at 20 to $35 million. Uh, lock facilities in Chicago, Sault Ste. Marie, as well as Buffalo, New York. Marinas also have a, a bit of a shorter lifespan than other infrastructures. That's around 40 or 50 years, close to 80. That's previously. Now we'll move to the specific impacts of climate change on ports, marinas, harbors, and shorelines in the Great Lakes region. Um, climate change impacts that are particularly relevant to these areas may include changes in rainfall and increases in storm intensity, uh, increased erosion and sediment load, increases in stormwater, uh, water level changes in the lakes, as well as increased wave height and speed. Um, these greater wave heights can be associated with higher water levels and can also result in damage to port structures, harbor infrastructure, as well as 
marina docks and boats. Uh, moving to the specific impacts from lake level variability, um, this is something that shoreline managers need to prepare for, is the lake level variability. Um, water level changes that are different than historic Great Lakes ranges can affect coastal facilities and structures. Uh, generally, lake levels are at their lowest in the winter and highest in the summer and fall, as we know. Um, however, for the, for the last 15 years, the Great Lakes region experienced lower lake levels than average, but uh, quite recently, that trend has reversed. Um, according to the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab at NOAA, uh, since September 2014, all of the Great Lakes have, in fact, been above their average monthly levels for the first time since the late 1990s. Um, and these levels are anticipated to remain high at least through this, the spring of this year. Um, the high levels of precipitation in late 2013-2014 ended this 15-year below average trend for Lakes Michigan, Huron, and Superior. And as you can see from this quote at the bottom of the page, uh, the net rise in water levels on Lake Superior from January 2013 through December 2014 was roughly two feet, which was the highest net increase ever recorded for a two-year period. Um, so this uh, variability has benefits as well as drawbacks, particularly with respect to higher water levels. Um, some benefits include enhanced higher power capacity, potential for increased tourism, particularly for recreational boating, and ease of commerce via shipping with uh, fewer concerns about low water levels. However, the drawbacks include uh, shoreline property damage, coastal erosion, flooding, reduced beach access and beach tourism, as well as impacts to the fishing industry. Um, in cases of low water levels, ships uh, cannot necessarily be fully loaded but because vessels may be damaged by hitting channel bottoms or become stuck underneath structures when water levels do rise, which reduces access to shipping channels and ports. Um, as these levels fluctuate, harbor structures may become unstable. Uh, beaches may become exposed, which affects the aesthetic quality of, and tourism potential of the area. Um, if sedimentation does occur, dredging may be required. Dredging is costly, may take several years to complete. This, so this can result from both higher and lower average lake levels. Um, moving to forecasting these lake levels, um, this is a complex process and accounts for a variety of factors including precipitation on the lake itself, evaporation, as well as runoff from terrestrial areas. Um, there are uh, hydrologic simulation models that are often used. Uh, one is known as AHPS, or the Great Lakes Advanced Hydrologic Pr Prediction System, which combines historical data on climate and weather patterns with emergent forecasting methods. Um, however, weather anom anomalies, such as the polar vortex from 2014, uh, can make this lake level prediction quite difficult. Each lake is unique in its geology, watershed, volume, and size. Uh, the lakes are also interconnected, so this compounds accurate forecasting ability. Um, uh, data from GLISA demonstrates uh, that ice coverage on the Great Lakes has a direct effect on evaporation from the lakes and is a factor in overall water levels. This corresponds to the chart on your screen. Uh, from 1973 to 2010, there is an average 71% decline in ice levels across all Great Lakes. However, as we discussed in the past uh, year or so, there's been an increase. Um, so given these uncertainties, it is best for shoreline managers to prepare for both higher and lower lake levels in the future. Uh, moving to resiliency planning. In, in the face of these climate impacts. It, because it's difficult to anticipate these water levels in the future, uh, municipalities may wish to engage in resiliency planning for higher and lower lake levels. Many communities have already begun drought and flood contingency planning. <clears throat> Some of these strategies can include installing floating docks that can move with varying water levels, um, incorporating soft shore engineering practices to stabilize and protect coastal areas against wave erosion. Some of these would include natural features and vegetation, uh, such as the image seen on your screen, um, as opposed to hard infrastructure, such as seawalls. Um, these soft shore engineering me methods can also offer added aesthetic benefits. Um, they also often incorporate habitat for fish and wildlife. Hard engineering does not necessarily. And soft shore engineering 
is not necessarily appropriate for all vulnerable areas, so it is best used where hard infrastructure is not necessarily needed. Um, shoreline setbacks are another measure to use, as well as plans for how navigation and dredging will be approached during these adverse conditions. Um, some of the climate impacts involve uh, storms, waves, and high winds, specifically. Uh, these changes can result in increased uh, severity and frequency of storms, which lead to larger waves and storm surges that can certainly damage infrastructure as well as docked watercraft. Uh, they can also cause shoreline erosion and coastal property damage. Um, another impact would be reduced vessel mobility and hindered harbor operations. This may also lead to human health threats and shipping delays, um, heightened sedimentation leading to dredging, infrastructure and sensitive harbor or port equipment may be damaged from high winds. Uh, high winds may also lead to spreading of contaminated materials or um, beach closures from excessive storm runoff, um, which may cause health impacts or loss of tourism, reduced quality of life, any of those uh, impacts. Varying water levels can also warp wooden structures and cause them to rot once they are exposed to oxygen. Uh, climate impacts also involve precipitation and temperature changes, which is a little, a little bit different from those uh, more intense storm um, and wind events. So extreme heat and cold may require additional energy in order to protect car cargo that's being stored at harbors and ports. Um, port employees who work primarily outside may be uh, exposed to more dangerous conditions and harsh weather. Um, warmer temperatures particularly heighten the risk of invasive species spread. The image on your screen is a sea lamprey, which is a particularly disruptive invasive species in the Great Lakes. Um, and these warmer temperatures can lead to uh, ecosystem disruption because of invasive species. Excessive freeze-thaw patterns can lead to cracks in breakwaters as well as other structures. And changes in lake ice cover can impact uh, sensitive species like whitefish and trout. Um, that are dependent on that aspect of the lake cycle. Uh, climate impacts on water quality. Um, one to particularly hi highlight is uh, algae blooms, uh, which I think many of us have been hearing about and talking about these days. Algae blooms increase the risk of hypoxic zones or dead zones, as well as fish kills, beach closures, and threats to human health and ecosystem health. Um, according to GLISA, rising carbon dioxide concentrations, warming lake temperatures, a longer stratified lake season, increasing extreme pre precipitation, and an abundance of nutrients are conspiring to increase the risk of harmful algal blooms, or HABs, particularly on Lake Erie. Uh, lake Erie is especially vulnerable to harmful algal blooms. Roughly 63% of its watershed is used for agriculture um, and phosphorus from fertilizers is a nutrient that contributes to algal bloom. Um, all of these things can become heightened in, the, in a climate change circumstance. Um, economic losses stemming from reduced recreational boating and beach use, usage can also be significant. In Lake Erie's harmful algal bloom of 2011, there was a $2.4 million loss to Ohio's recreational fishery alone and a $1.3 million loss to the state park system because of fewer visitors. Um, so as you can see, the, the climate impacts on water quality are significant in shoreline areas. Uh, moving on to dredging, something that we've mentioned several times, um, climate change may result in an increased need for dredging to avoid uh, commercial ships and recreational boats bottoming out in channels. Um, low water levels may adversely affect boat launches at marinas and public access points as well. But both increasing and decreasing water levels can necessitate dredging, uh, which is a costly and time-consuming procedure. For example, for the 58 docks in the Duluth Superior Harbor, which is the largest port on the Great Lakes, uh, dredging would cost $12 per cubic yard, which totals uh, $37.6 billion. Um, Toledo, as another example, is much smaller. The cost would be 11 to $12 million. Uh, dredging also poses an additional problem, which is what to do with the waste 
from dredging. Some contaminated materials may be brought to the surface, which creates environmental risks and requires additional expenditures. Um, so we'll discuss a few uh, options for repurposing dredge materials. Uh, the average annual dredging volume in the Great Lakes is 3 to 5 million cubic yards of material, half of which is contaminated. This contaminated material is placed in CDF, or confined disposal facilities. These can be costly to build and are also filling quite rapidly. However, per the Wisconsin Sea Grant, non-contaminated -contamin dredge material can have uh, many beneficial uses. It can provide fill for new developments, such as parks, plant communities, and beaches. Um, it can be used to cover landfills or seal off hazardous sites and inactive mines. It can also be used to create valuable topsoil for agriculture and urban greening use. Um, it can also be used for habitat restoration and mine land reclamation. Um, the picture on your right is a wetland created from this dredged material. Uh, now we'll address a few of the primary challenges that face Great Lakes shoreline managers. Um, this is certainly a complex issue. Uh, that can lead to some specific challenges to shoreline managers. Um, shoreline managers may face higher insurance premiums for ports and municipalities because of these unpredictable patterns. Oftentimes, port authorities themselves uh, do not own or have control over the infrastructure that they depend on, and they may not be able to secure funding sources independently. Um, each state defines its coastal management practices differently, and there's a variation between municipalities in terms of coastline jurisdiction and how to best operate a coastal management program. Currently, 34 states have approved coastal management programs. Um, the goal of these programs is to provide, protect natural resources, manage development in high hazard areas, give development priority to coastal dependent uses, provide public access for recreation, and coordinate state and federal actions in these areas. All right, at this point, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Catherine Call from the Nature Conservancy to tell us a bit more about her work on shoreline. Well, thanks, Laura. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining bring my presentation up here. Can you see that, Laura? Yep. OK. Well, thanks again for the opportunity to join you today. I can't really see who's on the phone, but uh, hello to anyone I've met out there. and looking forward to uh, meeting others of you. For those of you perhaps not familiar with the Nature Conservancy, we're a nonprofit conservation organization. We formed in 1951 and have um, offices or chapters in all 50 states and actually in 35 countries. So we work closely with Nature Conservancy Canada. Um, and, and, you know, we were founded as, and to and did the work of a traditional land conservancy to protect ecologically important lands and waters for biodiversity and for us, the people who use and benefit from those lands and waters. We, um, today, we employ a large number of scientists, and we address threats to conservation involving climate change and freshwater and oceans um, and conservation lands. We do a lot of work with partners to conserve ecologically important lands, really focused on the larger system health now and understanding the functions and trying to come up with innovative solutions for ways to um, create these win-win situations, create innovative financing mechanisms to help solve whole system problems um, related to our conservation efforts. <clears throat> In the Great Lakes region, uh, the kind of buckets that I would place our work in, it's really focused on, our work's focused around six strategies. Aquatic invasive species, climate change adaptation, coastal systems, native fisheries, northern forests, and agriculturally dominated watersheds. Um, this is a, I need to move, move something off my screen quickly here. Um, Sorry, I can't see my screen. Uh, this is a, I'm the Michigan Conservation Policy and Practices Specialist, as Laura mentioned, and I manage our coastal strategy in the Western Lake Erie Basin. This is a picture of staff from Michigan and Ohio that work on the Western Lake Erie Coastal Conservation Visioning Project that I manage. That's me in the top right, if I haven't met you before. Um, 
the real goal of um, this project, why is my slide not advancing? The, the um, goal of this visioning work is focused along a 150-mile stretch of coastal shoreline from Point Pelee in Ontario, around Michigan, across the state line at Toledo and down to Sandusky Bay. And our goal is really to understand where we can optimally meet both conservation goals, which are outlined in the Lake Erie Biodiversity Conservation Strategy. Uh, it was a two-year binational planning process. There were 87 entities, um, binational entities at the table, both from, or I guess from conservation, from municipalities, from the business sector um, to some degree. And so, um, again, sorry, I kind of got ahead of myself there. The goal is to understand where we can optimally meet those conservation goals outlined in the Lake Erie Biodiversity Conservation Strategy while also meeting human well-being goals. So where do people like to fish? Where do they like to swim? Where do they like to put their boat in, go hunting, take a hike, uh, sit on the beach and enjoy the view? How can we marry this idea of finding win-win solutions that, that benefit conservation as well as what people care about in this area? Um, and this is really helping to identify these ideal places for conservation investment. So we're engaging conservation, business, municipalities to think about these kind of win-win ideas for investment and restoration opportunities. And currently, uh, we're thinking about ways in which to incorporate resilience into these work. These places might be the right places to think about marrying these conservation and human, human well-being needs now, which I should back up and say these dark green areas are the places where that were optimally identified um, for conservation investment. And this, I could give a whole other presentation on this project, but I just wanted to make the point that they may be the right places to think about, um, again, marrying those conservation and human well-being needs now, but how might those priorities change as we consider lake level fluctuations, groundwater level changes, changes in precipitation, evaporation off the lakes, and temperature changes. So um, really interested in how we should be engaging new sectors, like engineering, for example, to um, think about outcomes for people who live here, for this for the economics of the region, um, for nature. And the Nature Conservancy is really looking at this Western Lake Erie project as kind of a demonstration site. How could we apply what we're learning there to, say, Green Bay or Saginaw Bay or Duluth? Um, and as, as you know, Laura mentioned a moment ago, we've got a shoreline of, of crumbling infrastructure in Western Lake Erie, in Western Lake Erie here and all around the Great Lakes and in our seawalls, our ports, our road stream crossings, bridges, dikes. None of these are... Um, doing a lot, for example, for the migratory fish passage, um, those fish that need to live part of their lives in the lake and part of their lives spawning or reproducing or growing up um, in rivers that they were born in or in wetlands. Um, and these fish are supporting not just uh, native biodiversity, but a you know, multi-million dollar sport and co commercial fishing and tourism industries at the same time. So um, I, I feel like I'm digressing a bit from the total intent of this. How they get involved in this uh, project, I'm supposed to be talking about adaptation examples. So um, I will say that prior to this project, I worked with uh, Kim Hall here at the Nature Conservancy. She's now the climate change ecologist in the Great Lakes and the Great Plains on our climate strategy. And uh, when I was working on our climate team, and I think this is why Nicola asked me to join you today, is to give an overview of a couple of case studies that I developed a couple of years ago through our national partnership um, between the NOAA Restoration Center and the Nature Conservancy. Heather Starrett, who some of you might know, she's the Great Lakes Regional Coordinator for um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's a National Ocean Service office, and she's really been instrumental in helping to advance the partnership in the Great Lakes between NOAA and the Nature Conservancy, and I know she does a lot of connecting around the region, and it was a lot of fun working with her and the NOAA team on these. But TNC completed five case studies in all, and the two that I'm going to focus on today, uh, these two in the bottom right here, focus on... Um, you know, what did changing Great Lakes water levels mean for coastal communities? And I'll also cover some tools that we focused on and, and share those with you. I will also briefly talk about um, a survey and a workshop process used to engage Great Lakes coastal communities in 2011 and 12. And it was really the intent was to understand the roadblocks to including climate considerations into planning. So I'll cover the high points of these case studies, point you to those, point you to downloadable versions of these, talk about the tools that I reference, and then I'll put it um, all of this in some context of newer work that's taking place in coastal adaptation and resilience efforts at the Nature Conservancy. 
So again, these are the two um, case studies I'll focus on. You can download them at nature.org slash Great Lakes Climate um, and click on the case studies link there. Um, for both of the case studies, the audience was Great Lakes coastal communities, planners, elected officials, developers, conservation practitioners, and our goal was really to showcase processes folks could use to think through how to include climate change information in ongoing projects, whether they're stormwater infrastructure or transportation or you know, planning and zoning. How do you think about climate change as you um, refine or adapt these these existing projects, or did you develop new projects um, or systems that you manage? So we provided back a, a big part of this case study. Um, we really work to clarify the current thinking for communities on how Great Lakes water levels are projected to change, and and described an approach for incorporating the anticipated variation in future lake levels into a decision framework. So at the time that this was written in, in 2012, there were so many pieces of information coming out saying the lakes are going to drop, the lakes are going to rise. There was a lot of, a lot of um, quickly evolving um, academic literature coming out that was getting translated a bit confusingly, I, it seemed, to practitioners. And so this was really an effort to kind of say, all right, here's kind of the nuts and bolts of things. And what can this possibly mean for us? In the meantime, while, while the scientists are figuring out what's going to happen, how should we be thinking about um, climate change as, as we're working in these communities? Um, so I provided, or we provided, um, two examples. One of them was using the International Joint Commission's um, the, the International Great Lakes Study had just come out in 2012. It had just been released, and it discussed um, the Lake Superior water regulation decision-making process, and it included considerations for future climate conditions and associated uh, water levels on the upper Great Lakes. So we looked at that decision-making um, framework that they used, and then we actually tried, we said, okay, well, let's put our money where our mouth is and see if we can apply that framework to something that we're working on. So we used that framework to think through um, adapting a plan for northern pike management in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, as many of you know, pike, you know, it's a great sport fishery, but there are a, there's a big socioeconomic dependency on, on making sure that that uh, species does well. Um, for the tourism industry, for the sport fishing industry. So, I mean, I guess a, a take-home message from this case study is that <clears throat> overall, because the, the as I said, we summarized a lot of the um, lake level change science that was current at that point, and, and the summary was that because the future basin-wide precipitation inputs and outputs, so that the elements of the water budget, which is precipitation is coming in, evaporation off the land and lake, are going out, and then there's also runoff off the land when it rains um, into the lake. So understanding that that water budget, and overall, because the basin-wide precipitation, you know, what's coming in and what's going out aren't really understood, we can't put a pinpoint on lake level projections. And I'm sure most of you have a fine grasp on that by now. Um, but the suggestion was that coastal communities should consider at this time that it might make more sense to invest in framing how the, the highest and the lowest water levels described in the historical record can impact local assets rather than base plans on results from the newest models because it was still getting, it is still getting figured out. Model, the modeling is evolving. So keeping this focus on identifying actions that protect the, the assets in your coastal community or in your region under a range of future conditions is really just a way to hedge our bets in the face of the uncertainty. Um, and we, you can see the table of how we crosswalk that planning approach um, between the IJC decision-making model and the application to northern pike management in the case study. It's not extremely detailed, but it really shows how to use that adaptation process laid out by the International Joint Commission. And I also showed, um, or we also showed five different tools that <clears throat> you know, and there are others coming out all the time. But in the case study, we show five tools, several that are highlighted as a way really to show how and what to use to step through the adaptation process. Um, and actually, at the time that I um, developed the case study, I'd done uh, some interviews with people, uh, different municipal planners, folks from 
American Planning Association, um, different municipalities, just key conservation and business and planning sectors in the region as I was gathering content for that case study. And so I developed a video accompaniment that really highlights some of these tools that I will say more about in a moment and speaks to the purpose of our conversation here today. So Laura, if, if it's possible to run that video, let's try it. All right. Uh, hold on one minute and we'll get this, see if we can get this pulled up. Bear with us, folks. We had a little uh, national and okay. Little challenge getting this to run, so we'll have our fingers crossed. Okay. Make it I believe we'll have it going in a minute. The Great Lakes are both a national and an international treasure. They contain over 20% of the Earth's fresh. All right, let's get the audio. Sorry, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Surface water. They provide. I think I jinxed us yesterday. I said to Laura <laughs> that there's nothing worse than the tech not working out on a webinar, and I was so glad we had this figured out ahead of time. And um, I think we ran into a little, a few more challenges this morning. So Good. apologies. Yeah. Um. I believe the audio should work now. Thanks for it. Great Lakes are both a national and an international treasure. They contain over 20% of the Earth's fresh surface water. They provide many, many needs for the 45 million people who live in the Great Lakes region, everything ranging from uh, fresh drinking water to energy creation. It also is very important from the perspective of the local economy. If you'd like to make a call,
like Can you? you're only working off your the phone is not connected to hear what you're doing. So just yeah. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, Katie, uh, feel free to continue with your presentation. We'll send the link to that video um, following the presentation. I apologize. Okay. Okay. So I'm not sure what happened. I'm not sure what happened. Sound, but it's coming across my computer and the phone, and then I'm hearing it feedback. So. <laughs> okay. We can hear you, Katie. Okay. Sorry, I'm just not doing well on my end. Okay. Looks good. <laughs> So, um, wow, there's so much feedback. So without, um, when I talk about cli the climate adaptation planning approach, I could back up and say that, you know, what I really mean is preparedness or resiliency planning. And it's, it's possible that you all have seen this. Um, sorry, I got to turn down the volume here. Um, sorry, that you've seen this kind of framework before where, um, the adaptation process is really identifying climate change impacts, what, what is the, the temperature precipitation, um, the, the, what are the what changes are the anticipated in the region that you're working in or to the system that you're managing, what are the local or regional um, vulnerabilities, what are your threats, what are your assets, what is really going to go wrong, what, what can you not have go wrong, therefore helping to focus in on what you need to address. Identifying strategies based on, you know, what those um, most important um, vulnerabilities are, identifying opportunities for cost sharing, collaboration across sectors, I was touching on earlier, thinking about the most important partnerships that you can create to prioritize the strategies that are going to help address those key vulnerabilities putting them into action, and then evaluating what worked, what didn't work, and, and correcting. So um, the adaptation cycle. <clears throat> well, some of the tools that you would have seen in that video, which it sounds like you're going to receive in your email, um, I'll present a couple of those quickly now. Um, you may be familiar with some of these. But as you're thinking about kind of that first step in the adaptation process, identifying climate change impacts, you know, what's going to change? NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory's Great Lakes Dashboard Project uh, provides a way to visualize and examine historic Great Lakes water levels and the future projection comparisons at um, a variety of time scales that you can designate. And options are available for customizing output graphs that are going to be helpful in talking with folks that you work, um, committees you are on, in addition you know, to looking across different time scales, being able to understand within a, a 10 year horizon, a 30 year horizon, a 100 year horizon, how to think about planning and budgeting, um, and how to, how to incorporate the lake level changes into that. So there are four different dashboards available now to look at. Uh, the website to access those is, is at the top of the screen. Um, and again, just the safest suggestion that's coming out of the research there is to plan with those bookends of the worst case and the best case in mind um, and expect a range of everything in between. Another um, tool to help with that first step in adaptation planning is Climate Wizard. You may, or, you may have seen this before. The um, Nature Conservancy developed it with folks from University of Washington and University of Southern Mississippi. But it's really a way to understand how temperature and precipitation are changing anywhere in the world you're interested in um, and visualize impacts over the next 30 to 100 years. And you can look at the data in multiple ways. There's a custom analysis option up in the top right that, where you can query specifically 
more specifically what you're interested in. You're able to download the data as a GIS layer to use along with other data that you're using. And, and all of this information can be used along with other tools to inform, again, your community's planning goals, resource management, investment decisions. Um, so, it, you know, in a nutshell, it allow, the tool allows you to, um, under a range of different climate conditions, visualize the regional range of historic and potential future temperature and precipitation fluctuation over time. And so once you understand how the climate's changing in your region, how it's going to affect the thing that you're managing, say it's, um, you know, your local beaches or it is your stormwater infrastructure and you're thinking about flow rates, you want to explore how to um, assess those vulnerabilities and threats and impacts, who's doing a great job at it, who, who's active in the um, literature, who is putting out best practices, what tools can I use, what do others in the room think, and you know, how can I work more easily with them. So this one, one portal, the Collaboratory for Adaptation to Climate Change, where you can see what others are doing. It hosts an online version of NatureServe's Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment Tool. It has an online meeting space, tools and models. Certainly, um, the forum that we're in right now, the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, is another place to connect with folks, and you're already doing that, which is fantastic. Um, one more um, portal that you may be interested in, uh, the Association of State Flood Planning Users have a Great Lakes Coastal Resilience Planning Guide. And it has um, resources for mapping and analyzing and reporting. And actually, a lot of folks on this call are really the target audience for this effort. Um, it has case studies, data, maps, tools, kind of in three buckets that you can see at the bottom. This is just a screen capture of their home page. Uh, those three buckets being land use and zoning, habitat and environment, and infrastructure challenges. Um, so those you know, state and elected officials engaged in coastal management, planning, and development can really look at how trends in short-term and, and long-term climate conditions affect hazards and their impacts on land and water resources that they're managing. So something really good about this portal that I like, are it keeps very current on the events, upcoming meetings, events, conferences, as well as funding opportunities that have to do with planning and risk and hazard assessment with regard to climate change. It does have a lot of links to tools and data assembled all in one place. Um, a lot of these sites that I'm showing you kind of overlap and, and, and um, refer to each other, and I think that's a good thing. Um, it also houses some case studies um, and focuses really, I mean, this is the Association of Floodplain Managers putting this together, so it really is focused more on municipal planners. Um, and helping to make a bridge between risk reduction and hazards assessment, but it's also trying to make that connection to um, conservation and how can you benefit natural assets um, as you're trying to handle the socioeconomic strains of, that a community is managing. Um, Digital Coast is another great resource. The NOAA Coastal Services Center sponsors this website and it houses a lot of geospatial data, um, a lot of GIS data layers and visualization tools so you can kind of it, do some scenario planning with a lot of the tools that are housed here. Um, they also offer trainings to help planners and practitioners really maximize the data that they already have and what's on their site. And in order to improve the site, NOAA facilitates the Digital Coast Partnership and it's made up of about eight national partners of which TNC is one who helps steer the data and give input into content needs and identify barriers that communities are experiencing. So certainly this is a group that um, you can network with if you're not already. Um, talk to them about your needs and they are very receptive um, and I'd be happy to talk with you more about this as well as I said because TNC is a partner. One thing that you might be really interesting in accessing from their site right now. Um, I think that these are fantastic. These are these county coastal snapshots. And they, as a, I just, again, grabbed a screen capture from their website. But it really just shows, um, I have the one from Lincoln County, Ohio, in front of me right now. It shows the uh, social benefits, the economic benefits, the conservation benefits of um, flood protection, protecting coastal wetland infrastructure to think about um, reducing storm surge and flood abatement. Um, it's talking about um, 
the, econ the economic resources that different coastal assets in each coastal county bring to the region. Gives statistics on um, historic flood events. It's just a, it's a these are really great one pagers that you can print out free from their website, um, and it kind of gives you a springboard to start thinking about some issues that you may not already be looking at in the region. The second case study that I'll um, focus on quickly, I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that I would mention two of them. Um, I'll briefly de discuss uh, this one, but we focused on exploring and advancing understanding in the way that coastal communities are moving forward on climate adaptation in the Great Lakes region. And again, this is a couple years old, but at, um, at the time, we really just wanted to describe this community needs driven um, climate outreach and engagement process that NOAA had been pushing forward at the time. Um, and we wanted to relay some survey data on the adaptation challenges and motivations that communities were, the way in which they were responding to a series of surveys and interactions with these workshops. So again, the audience for this was coastal communities. Um, and I described the goals. We really wanted to describe this engagement process and relay the survey data. And the real challenge or the need for this is that across the region, lots of papers coming out, lots of tools to help you, lots of outreach efforts have been developed over the last few years to increase understanding of climate change trends and projected future impacts and provide an introduction to all of this. But we were hearing that a lot of decision makers aren't really necessarily aware of all these resources, where to go, which ones are right for them and really unsure about how to connect those resources to their own work. So the challenge for both the practitioners using the climate information, um, this may sound very familiar, <laughs> as well as those are who are developing resources to try and help in the adaptation process, um, the real challenge is creating and maintaining that cross-sector communication of climate adaptation resource needs and then disseminating the right resources in the right format to really help. So <clears throat> in a series of workshops uh, were developed to really reach out in the Great Lakes region and ask how can um, how can a workshop process help achieve um, more climate change awareness and understanding and really get more on the ground action happening. And then through this workshop, we wanted to understand what lessons could we learn um, from those who are already adapting their planning and policy or on the ground management actions to include climate considerations. And then those, for those who haven't yet started, why, what else needs to be done? So through this case study, um, we wanted to answer those questions and wanted to really explore the effectiveness of this multi-year climate outreach and engagement process that NOAA had been engaging in, specifically the Planning for Climate Impacts workshop series that they put on. And there were, um, I was involved in all of those workshops. They were in Cleveland, Duluth, and Green Bay. Um, so in 2011 and 12, there was a Great Lakes Climate Needs Synthesis that was put out that was uh, a summary of a survey effort that went out to about 700 different um, Great Lakes communities around around the region. Then there was a training module developed based on the feedback they got from that synthesis. And then, so it was a train the trainer, so folks really understood how to hold work, hold these workshops and um, design these workshops in response to what communities that they needed. And then ultimately, we had the workshops and, and gathered even more survey data there. So I know that sounds like holy moly, plan to plan, but um, it was a tremendous effort, and we followed up with phone surveys. And this this case study is really um, it's a it's a quick reflection of that whole process with take home messages for um, those developing climate resources, those using climate resources, coastal communities trying to put things into action, and really looking at the cycle of um, knowledge gain, putting things into practice, and then becoming um, an actor oneself. So really show the effectiveness of these workshops because NOAA and partners at University of Green Bay and University of Michigan really took the time to understand what communities needed on the front end. So we, you know, we really tracked advancements in, in the learning process. And I, the way, I feel like the way I'm explaining this is very academic, but um, there was, some, there was a, you know, great interaction at these workshops and this understanding that really for those that were being and getting stuff happening on the ground in their communities. They were really posing, you know, putting climate change adaptation 
sometimes they weren't even mentioning, but they were, you know, just considering it as one consideration among all the others that they have to consider that communities need to weigh as they plan for the future. And when you make the argument in dollars and cents, it's, it's pretty hard to deny um, that it makes sense to include it. So I'm not sure if I gave that case study uh, the, the full uh, description, but um, you can take a look at it at nature.org slash Great Lakes Climate. Um, over the last few years, uh, the Nature Conservancy's Coastal Resilience Program has really done some innovative work. I'm switching gears just a little bit. Um, and a lot of this work has largely been done on the Salty Coast, so, you know, the Gulf of Mexico, um, on the Atlantic Coast, Coast Sandy, um, and, and on the West Coast as well. But we've been talking about, you know, what does coastal resilience look like in a large freshwater system like the Great Lakes? Um, we don't have risks like hurricanes and tsunamis here, but we do have flooding, we have stations, we have storm surge. How do we do a better job of modeling that risk and taking proactive measures through community planning efforts, working with insurance and engineering industries? And that's what this coastal resilience program is really focused on. And I anticipate um, more work in the Great Lakes region through this program coming up. So to kind of see some examples of what this program is doing, you can go to coastalresilience.org and it really gives some fantastic case study examples. They're not, again, they're on they're in saltwater coasts and some of this work is international. But I think that it's important to think about um, you know what how can we be applying this thinking in the Great Lakes. Um, an internal program that the Nation Conservancy has is the North American Resilience and Risk Reduction Project, and there are 24 demonstration sites around North America. I mentioned that I was um, this coastal strategy for our work in coastal western Lake Erie, and that is one of the demonstration sites. Um, the goal of this coastal resilience and risk reduction program is really to demonstrate to the private sector, to governments, and to the public that healthy habitats effectively reduce risk to people, property, from storms and floods. So specifically through this program and at this demonstration site in Western Lake Erie, um, we want to be able to create public acceptance and appetite for natural infrastructure solutions by showing results in real places. So um, let me continue before I get ahead of myself. We want to protect communities by advancing policies that make disaster preparedness and response programs more effective and affordable and support private sector innovation by partnering with the insurance and engineering industry. So in many ways, uh, the emergence of this risk reduction resilience program with, within these 24 demonstration sites around North America is illustrating kind of this evolution over the last few years and in, in the thinking internally here. And we've been talking about frameworks for climate adaptation, as you know, I showed in those case studies that we wrote a couple of years ago, but we're now undertaking um, Internally, the 50-state climate initiative largely focused on mitigation, so slowing the rate of climate change, or really focused on emission scenarios and what each chapter can do with the Nature Conservancy to advance climate policy. So, you know, now considering this evolving business model that I just described and the kind of the way that we're trying to think about things in Western Lake Erie and where we look for innovative ways to bring more chairs to the same table to find solutions that are going to benefit our conservation goals, but also socioeconomic values, um, that will ideally bring creative financing mechanisms to achieve these win-win solutions for conservation and people there as well. Um, I guess one example I could show you of what I mean by these natural infrastructure solutions, and again, this is an early win, and it's down in Mobile Bay, Alabama, but I think it's a really interesting one. Um, they built this, they're building 100 miles of oyster reefs. Um, and it's going to provide habitat for oyster larvae, which is important for um, the oyster fishery. fishery. Um, so that it's, it's a commercial asset. It's, recre it's recreationally important to restore this place. Um, but it's also, this oyster reef is also dampening wave energy and decreasing erosion as sea levels rise and they get more inundation, saltwater inundation in these freshwater estuaries. Um, it's, doing a good thing to the environment as well. It's stabilizing the sediment transport and increasing turbidity. And so you know, we don't have wave action in the Great Lakes, but how can we think about these kinds of um, some new variation of natural infrastructure solutions in the Great Lakes? So coming back to this work in Western Lake Erie and managing this coastal strategy, and you know, we're thinking now about um, 
we have this informed foundation of science-based goal setting. We know where we're trying to get to with regard to migratory fish and birds and um, coastal wetland restoration goals and thinking about um, connecting channels like the Detroit River and our islands. And we're thinking about the people who live there and the things that have been translated that are important related to these conservation goals. But now we're looking at, okay, how are we going to pay for that? How can we work with, say, the engineering sector to find some of these win-win outcomes in Western Lake Erie? We have, again, the shoreline of some crumbling infrastructure and our seawalls and ports and road stream crossings and bridges and dikes. And um, we have a migratory fishery that is important not just for biodiversity, but for this multi-million dollar sport and commercial fishing industry as well as the tourism industry. So um, I, I guess I'm excited to start thinking about how to apply these concepts in Western Lake Erie. And I certainly um, look forward to any ideas from folks on the phone. Again, I can't see who's on the phone. So uh, um, conversation now or offline, um, following up on this call. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Call. Uh, we have just a few minutes for questions. Um, we had one come up previously from uh, Mayor John Dickert of Racine, Wisconsin. This is going back to the, the infrastructure and the, just the current infrastructure and kind of how that came to be. He's wondering if that goes back to removal of wetlands or um, disappearing wetlands, kind of what the the source of that problem is. I didn't hear the beginning of your question. Could you repeat that, please? Sure. Uh, the crumbling infrastructure you particularly mentioned around Lake Erie, yeah, if that stems from removal of wetlands and think of where, that, where that comes from. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, I mean, that was a broad statement, and a lot of what, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, we've been looking at a map thinking about Corps of Engineer structures um, specifically, where they are looking at um, a lot of hard infrastructure improvements that need to be made. And I mentioned the map um, that we had developed through that visioning process to show where natural solutions and invest conservation investments would be primed to make um, with regard to meeting our conservation goals and addressing human well-being needs. So, one thing that we're looking at is how would this map of needs through the Corps of Engineers, where they have identified um, crumbling infrastructure that they need to replace over the next, well, very soon, um, you know, how does that overlay with our vision map? And how could we um, think about creating some win-win solutions there? How could we think about shoreline softening efforts um, instead of putting up a seawall? I'm not sure if that answers the question. Sure. Great. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions, and we are right at uh, 11 or 12 here, um, I will say thank you very much, Dr. Call. Thanks, everyone, for bearing with us through some technical difficulties. And we will send out links to these resources. They're really fantastic things, uh, exciting to hear about all those different opportunities for um, implementing some adaptation and mitigation strategy. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.